Welcome to today's local government education webinar, Think Global, Eat Local, provided by University of Illinois Extension. My name is Nancy Wadrago, Extension Specialist in Community and Economic Development. For sound quality, we'll mute microphones during the presentation, and if you have any problems connecting, please add those concerns to the chat space, as well as add any questions you have during the presentation to the chat space. I'll monitor that. Uh, chat space and post questions to the presenters at the end of the presentation. Today's recorded webinar will be made available on our local government education website and YouTube channel. Today we have Pamela Shellhorn, Community and Economic Development Educator, serving Bonn, Clinton, Jefferson, Marion, and Washington counties, and she and her team, whom she'll introduce now, will discuss how communities and community projects can address food access needs while encouraging engagement and environmental sustainability. At this time, I'll turn it over to Pam Shalhorn. Welcome everyone to today's Think Global, Eat Local webinar. Today you will hear about several examples of community food projects that have been started in South Central Illinois. Before beginning, I would like, just like to mention that Illinois Extension staff are located in every county of the state. If you are interested in starting or expanding a community food project in your community and could use Extension assistance, please make sure you check out the University of Illinois Extension website for an office located near you. Also feel free to put your questions in the chat box during the presentation and we will answer them at the end of the program. My colleague, Ashley Hoffman, SNAP educator, will begin the presentation, followed by Dr. Lori George, Small Farms Local Food Educator, and Liz Miller, Youth Development Educator. Okay, thank you, Pam. Hi, everyone. This is Ashley Hoffman. Um, I'm a SNAP Ed educator, and I'm going to highlight some of the food access issues that we have in Illinois and also talk about what our SNAP Ed team does in the state of Illinois. These may be familiar terms, but food security is the federal measure of a household's ability to provide enough food for every person in the household to have an active, healthy life. Food insecurity is one way that we measure the risk of hunger and food deprivation. And the USDA actually defines food insecurity as a lack of consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. In 2017, an estimated one in eight Americans were food insecure, which is about 40 million Americans, and that includes more than 12 million children. Now, for a lot of families throughout the country and in Illinois, food insecurity may arise because families need to make choices on whether they should buy food for their family or pay their power bill. It's also important to note that food insecurity is a household situation, not an individual situation. Um, while food insecurity affects everyone in a household, it may affect them differently. And by that I mean parents or caregivers may go without eating meals to ensure that their children are getting enough food, but they themselves are actually going without food. According to Feeding America, approximately 1,413,420 uh, residents in the state of Illinois face food insecurity. And of that, roughly uh, 459,000 um, of those are children in Illinois who are living with food insecurity. Another term that is used when discussing food access is a food desert. Food deserts are areas that have limited access to affordable and nutritious foods such as fresh fruits and vegetables in impoverished areas. This is largely due to a lack of grocery stores, farmers markets, and healthy food providers. Transportation is also an issue in these areas as well. These areas instead may have quick marts, gas stations, convenience stores that are stocked with convenient, processed, high sugar, and high fat food items. As you can see from the map on the screen, the green pockets are USDA-designated food deserts 
in the state of Illinois. And you can find this map um, and any in data throughout the entire country on food deserts at um, the USDA's website. Now let's move on to what our SNAP-Ed team does in the state of Illinois. For those not familiar with SNAP-Ed, it is the nutrition promotion and obesity prevention component of the federally funded SNAP program. We work with limited resource audiences to make healthier choices where they eat, shop, live, and play in their communities. Our goal is to make the healthy choice the easy choice for low-income people who are eligible for SNAP. And we do that with providing direct nutrition education classes environmental interventions, and technical assistance in K through 12 schools, early childhood centers, food pantries, and youth and adult programs. As a SNAP Ed educator, I also work with local organizations to promote healthier settings and food choices, further increasing impact. By focusing on improving this food access, increasing the likelihood of healthy selections, and helping families save more money, we are making a difference in the lives of Illinois families and their communities. So why is SNAP-Ed outreach important? Well, you can read the number of reasons, but it does help families to develop skills um, that they need to help use their SNAP benefits uh, more efficiently. It increases healthy eating behaviors in children. They're eating more fruits and vegetables. And it also can help improve cooking schools to people with limited financial resources and actually have to help them purchase foods within a budget. So there are a number of reasons why SNAP-Ed um, education is, is very important. As you can see, we are reaching Illinois families in need. Last year alone, 1.6 million Illinois residents were reached through our SNAP-Ed programming. On this slide, you'll see what some of our SNAP-Ed classes look like in Illinois. Children who participate in SNAP-Ed prefer healthier foods and beverages, improve cooking schools, and are more physically active. Six in 10 adults who attend short, interactive sessions said they will make a healthy change that week. So as you can see, SNAP-Ed is making a difference in the lives of children and adults with limited resources in the state of Illinois. And now I'll hand it over to Lori George, our Ag and Natural Resource Educator. Thanks, Ashley. So a large part of my job as a, a small farms local foods educator through the ENR program is to connect with businesses, organizations, and individuals to discuss uh, options on how they can make a difference to help decrease food insecurities and food deserts within their communities. These five areas, farmers markets, community gardens, school gardens, food banks, and mobile markets, are a few of the projects available to them. According to the USDA, a farmer's market is where two or more farmer producers sell their own agricultural products directly to the general public at a fixed location, which can include like fruits and vegetables, meat, fish, poultry, dairy products and grains. But really it's more than that. It's a place where the community can meet on a weekly or monthly basis to connect with friends and neighbors. And local fruit and vegetable growers are able to connect with the community itself. Individuals can reach out to the grower and get a sense of how the produce was grown, talk about food safety issues, obtain products that are not generally found in retail food stores such as heirloom tomatoes and flat peaches. Farmers markets cater to families where the parents can find fresh fruits and vegetables and the kids can connect with where their food comes from. A community garden is a tract of private or public line gardened by friends, neighbors, or groups of people 
utilizing either individual or shared plots. Community gardens can be located in neighborhoods, schools, and in public housing. It can be incorporated into hospitals, nursing homes, churches, and senior centers. There are several types of community gardens that can be incorporated either through organizational and or citywide efforts. Community and or gift gardens, gift meaning growing Illinois food together, are created by community members who help develop and share in the work and harvest. Food harvested is for all members in the community garden or donated to local food pantries. Community organizations can create horticultural therapy gardens that are aimed at nursing homes, hospitals, senior centers, prisons, etc. These gardens help to improve memory, socialization, and have been used by horticultural therapists for rehabilitation and healthcare issues. Youth and school gardens. These gardens incorporate hands-on gardening with classroom instruction. These efforts engage youth by showing them where their food comes from, and it can be incorporated into school lesson plans by teaching basic business principles, job and life skills, as well as environmental stewardship and sustainability. Some of the programs that have been incorporated within our region are the after-school programs working with children, uh, initiating hydroponic systems, and working with high school kids and adults. These programs have made a difference in how the kids view food insecurities and food deserts within their specific communities and what they can do to help mitigate these issues. A food bank is usually a nonprofit charitable organization that distributes food to those that have difficulty purchasing enough food to avoid hunger. Donations to local food banks help friends and neighbors that are struggling with hunger and food insecurity. Donations come from local farmers, businesses, community members, farmers markets, and community food drives. Food is then repackaged and distributed to businesses throughout a local or regional area, as well as directly to communities in need. Volunteers in the communities assist in inspecting the food, sorting, labeling, and distributing to community members. Sometimes the best way to bring in fresh fruits and vegetables is to develop a collaboration with a local or regional food bank to help bring in products. It's not necessarily grown locally, but the community is able to help reduce these food deserts within the community. A mobile market is an operational model where perishable food items are delivered and immediately distributed. There's no charge to the community, no income verification, and no one is refused. Food is generally distributed on a first come, first serve basis until it's gone. Renovated trucks or trailers are generally used to bring the food into urban or rural areas. Distribution may be once or twice a week or several times a month, and it's generally set on a schedule. Some mobile markets accept those SNAP benefits or have subsidies that make the food affordable to low-income families without or within a community. University of Illinois Extension has the knowledge and resources to assist your group or organization in the development of a community food project. Extension volunteers and staff are available to make site visits throughout the planning, development, and implementation stages, as well as follow-up visits. Training workshops can be developed on a wide range of horticultural, marketing, and sustainability topics based on the needs of each individual project. University of Illinois Extension has numerous horticulture and small farms local food publications that are available at all Extension offices as well as on the internet. And now I'm going to take it over to Pam Schellhorn talking about sustainability. Thanks, Lori. Well, you've heard a lot about why we need community food projects, and you've heard about um, how extension can help you and what types of projects are out there. Uh, what I want to talk about today is sustainability. Um, sustainability is important. How are you going to keep that community food project going year one, year two, year three, and beyond? 
Um, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, volunteers. Um, when you're talking about sustaining a community garden, one of the most crucial elements is uh, volunteers. Without their continued support and hard work, a project will not survive for very long. I also want to encourage everyone to make sure that you treat them like the assets they are. Um, there's several types of volunteers when you're looking at a community food project. Well, any project really, but the first one are champions. Those champions of your project, three to five individuals dedicated to the project and in it for the long haul. Uh, they are crucial. They are, they're generally involved in the planning session. They have a passion for the community garden or the community food project, and they're going to be around um, for several years. They keep the passion in the community. They talk about it with the community. Um, they are a very important part. Second are helpers. You want to make sure you have at least 10 to 20 individuals who are willing to show up. They may or may not be your champions. But they're the ones that always show up when it's time to build those garden beds or package that food that comes out of the uh, food market or food bank. The third one is the financial supporters. Need them. We're going to talk a little bit more about raising uh, money for your community food project. But financial supporters, uh, they can be people in the community willing to provide funding both in dollars and in kind. Uh, next is your media. You want to make sure that the media is on board with your project. Um, we have been very lucky in this region with our local newspapers and them uh, radio stations willing to help us get the word out, whether we're looking for funding or we're expanding the gardens or mobile markets, um, whatever project we might be working on. Uh, last but not least is technical assistance. And Lori and Lori just mentioned about how the University of Illinois Extension Ag and Natural Resources Program Coordinators can help, small farms, local food educators, as well as master gardeners and others in the community. And I've actually um, put master gardeners on this list because they are a critical part of a lot of the community food projects that you want to do. Uh, for those of you who are not that familiar with Extension, University of Illinois Extension has a long-standing program called Master Gardeners. There's actually formal training available, and I believe if you're interested in doing a community garden or some other project that requires gardening, that you check with your Extension offices and see when their next Master Gardener classes start. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful program. It's a great way to interact with other people in the community and a great way to get involved in some really um, fun projects. Grants. The one thing I want to mention about grants is this is temporary funding only. You don't want to have to rely on grant funding year after year after year. You're going to have to find other ways to raise money. But it is sometimes nice to have a grant in the beginning or maybe a couple years down the road when you need extra equipment or rebuild beds. Um, Dr. George and her team have created a community garden toolkit that includes three pages of grants available for community food projects. I was not aware until this morning that the document is not available statewide, so we will make sure to send one via email to everyone who registered for this workshop. And I'll send out that email with the uh, Community Garden Toolkit uh, along with the link to the recording for this program. Next is fundraising events. Uh, this is for ongoing financial support. And all of the examples I'm showing you in my portion of the slide presentation are um, fundraising and other things we did to raise money for the Mount Vernon community gardens in Mount Vernon, Illinois. Um, pictured here is actually a garden to table event uh, where community members and others came and had a lot of fun. Um, the event was held at a local restaurant in Mount Vernon. Uh, we charged $75 per plate with a cash bar. Over 30 attended the event on May 7, 2017, and the group raised a net of $2,000. 
The restaurant even took the time to purchase all of the food that was served from local producers, including the Cornish hens. Uh, the event was a really big success, and like I said, we ended up netting $2,000 for the garden project. Next is in-kind donations. I call this free stuff. Um, everything from water installations, tools, items for silent auctions, and t-shirts can come from various local businesses, and they cost you nothing. Um, as I mentioned on the slide, make sure you always thank them. The photos here are examples of in-kind donations for the Mount Vernon Community Garden Project in Mount Vernon. Uh, local artists and businesses donated items for a silent auction the night of the Garden to Table event, uh, which helped raise additional funds. And a local plumbing contractor installed all of the plumbing, including two special hydrants for the garden. The estimated cost of the plumbing alone was three to $4,000. So in-kind donations can be critical to your community food project. And for any of you that are visiting that are city officials or community leaders, you're gonna notice that so far I've not talked about city funding at all. Um, we, uh, the other way that we raised money for the community gardens in Mount Vernon was through crowdfunding and social media. Now this was, sort of a new twist. There were a lot of people that weren't familiar with the crowdfunding. Um, and so I'm gonna talk just a little bit about it. The garden project in Mount Vernon raised $4,300 in 30 days. Um, these campaigns, uh, they're quick, they're intense, but you can raise lots of money. In addition, it not only provided the startup funding for the project, but gave the initial planning group confidence that this was the project the community truly wanted. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind when you're doing a crowdfunding campaign is one, you need to make sure you have a designated person that can run that campaign on a daily basis. It only lasts for about 30 days, so you need someone that's there to continue to communicate and give updates to your donors. You also need to make sure that you have some of those volunteers I talked about that are actually out in the community or sending emails to see if they can't solicit funds. Um, it's not, you just don't put a crowdfunding campaign online and someone will find it. There's millions of crowdfunding campaigns out there right now. Okay, sorry, there was an interruption. Um, the average amount of a campaign is generally about $3,000, and the best campaigns only last 20 to 40 days. Um, I also recommend you try to find local matching opportunities. Uh, this can make it much more than just an online campaign. Uh, what that means as far as matching is maybe going to a local bank and saying, okay, if we raise $1,000, will you give us 500 and, and either, or another thousand, and that would match those dollars and increase the money you're, you're raising. Make sure you answer the questions, why should I contribute $25? When you're on crowdfunding, you have to make this very appealing. I mean, you're out there with, like I said, over a million different crowdfunding campaigns. So why is your project important? And it's probably gonna be more important to the local region. So that's where you're gonna focus some of your attention. Um, what they do in order to answer that question of why I should contribute $25 is generally you want to put in sponsored rewards. That's what the crowdfunding platforms call it. Uh, for instance, um, with the Mount Vernon Community Gardens, if someone donated on the crowdfunding site $250 or more, they had their names put on a wall of thanks, which is actually going to be installed, I think, here in just the next couple of months. Um, that really helped a lot. In fact, there were more $250 donations on crowdfunding than what I had initially expected. Next, for $50, they were able to receive a t-shirt and a tote. Uh, for $25, they received a tote with a garden logo on it. Um, we also made sure that these were one of a kind. Um, when you're doing your initial crowdfunding campaign, you want to make sure that um, it's uh, one of a kind. And I can't stress enough the importance of videos, whether you're using them on your crowdfunding campaign or on your Facebook 
uh, post for your community food project, you want to make sure you use videos. You use those videos to keep people up to date as to what's happening with your project. Um, we, when we were working on the Mount Vernon Community Gardens, we did videos with a couple of children who were, became our speakers for the community gardens. Using children in videos works much better than having an adult asking for the same funds. It also made it a lot of fun. People really enjoyed it. And uh, we use those videos both on the crowdfunding campaign and also on a Facebook page that had been set up for the community gardens group. Just to demonstrate how powerful social media can be for a community food project, recently our um, Ashley Hoffman, who spoke a little bit earlier, is working on a new mobile market here in Mount Vernon, Illinois. And she posted one post, a single post on Facebook. It received 200 shares. 16,000 views and over 200 people attended the event. That was only one Facebook post. Once you can connect with people in your community that are interested in helping you with these community food projects, the more you get, the more you get out on Facebook, uh, the easier it is to market and let people know what's going on in your community. Finally, um, as I mentioned, uh, well, I'm going to mention now, I apologize. Uh, after raising more than $10,300 in private funding for the Mount Vernon Community Gardens, the Garden Committee decided it was time to give back to the community. After the last harvest on October 2017, they, with the assistance of Farm Bureau and Illinois Extension SNAP community workers, sponsored a free pick-or-treat event at the gardens. Despite the cold weather, over 160 children attended with more than 100 adults. The event was repeated in 2018. What I'm mentioning is sometimes when you're trying to raise money and you get into that mode, you kind of forget what the community food projects are all about, and that's giving. Now I'm going to turn the program over to our last speaker today. Liz Miller is our youth development educator. Liz, are you ready? I'm ready. Thank Hello you, and everyone. I, I uh, will move the slides for you. You just let me know. Thanks so much. I'd just like to bring us back uh, to the mobile markets. You can go ahead and advance the slide that were previously mentioned in the webinar. Um, we know that over 270,000 Illinoisans live in food deserts, which is an area where residents have limited or no access to affordable healthy food options, especially the fresh food, fruits and vegetables uh, within a convenient traveling distance. And sometimes the nearest food pantry is very far away. So to address the problem, the food banks that are in the Feeding America network operate these mobile pantry programs. Bringing a food dis distribution site to hard to reach places that need it the most. Um, this mobile market is a newer operational model where perishable food items are delivered and immediately distributed. Um, there is, again, no charge to the community for these. There is no income verifications. There, uh, no one is refused and the food is distributed on a first come first serve basis until it's gone. Um, it's a fantastic concept and it really does help to eliminate waste. Go ahead and advance the slide, please. Uh, extensions armed to teach individuals and families the skills and resources to select, grow, prepare, access, and preserve food in order to enhance their well being and health. This applies to our work with adults and it also applies to our work with youth. So I just ask that everyone please, please remember to include youth in your planning and your programs. The mobile market 4-H partnership programs are a great way to teach the youth about the issue of food insecurity, provide them an opportunity to become a part of the solution, and inspire them to lead change as they advocate for more food secure communities. We currently have three 4-H partnership sites. We have one in Nashville, which is located in Washington County. We have one in Centralia 
which is just inside the Clinton County line. And then we also have one uh, down in Sessor, located in Franklin County. Um, we're currently working on a potential partnership that's going to bring the mobile market to the south side of Mount Vernon. So in the mobile market, once per month, the youth meet at the site to receive the truck, unload, sort, bag, and distribute the perishable items to the people. The kids also help the elderly and disabled carry the food to their cars. Extension was able to get help uh, to get a mobile market started in New Douglas, located in Madison County. And I know there is an existing mobile market in Carlisle at St. Mary's Church. Uh, those last two that I mentioned are not youth partnership programs, uh, but they are in existence today. Mobile markets can be provided to communities that the food banks have identified as underserved. And one of the great things about Extension is that we can leverage an extensive volunteer base through our adult context as well as our youth context. You can go ahead and advance the slide. And lastly, I just wanted to share that through 4-H uh, in partnership with uh, Ag and Natural Resources, we also teach indoor gardening. Uh, we've provided the equipment and the training to a number of schools that are interested in building hydroponics gardens. We offer the schools some basic designs and then allow the students to choose which one they'd like to go with. Then we go into the school with the materials and help them build it. Many of the classrooms that we have hydroponics gardens uh, supply the cafeteria with the produce that they harvest. And I invite you to take a look at our Facebook page located at facebook.com forward slash 4-H hydroponics and check out all of the gardens that we have in the schools. Thank Next. you, Liz. We'll let uh, Nancy, you're going to start uh, working on the questions now. Yeah, let's, um, if anybody has any final questions uh, that they have thought of uh, for the presenters today, you can enter them in the chat box now. Um, we currently don't have any questions right now, but I'll let, uh, give a few moments uh, for people to think about questions they have about uh, if there was a community food project you saw um, that interests you or a particular aspect of, of the, the models that were presented to you today that you want to ask more about, you can do that. Um, while you guys are thinking of questions, I'm going to put up a short poll about the program and how you, um, if you had a, how well you learned the information, your knowledge gain on the, on the information presented today. Uh, the poll is, did, you, did this program increase your knowledge of community food projects? And you can just click right on the screen to, to log your answer. And I'll leave this poll up um, for a little while, while we are taking questions. Um, so currently we have one question and um, I'll pose this to Lori George and then she can answer and uh, okay. perhaps um, pass the, the mic around to other, the other presenters to, to see if they have something to add. But Lori, uh, do Extension Youth provide those food pantry sites in other places in the state? Um, well, the, the youth generally are going through with 4-H and it is the um, SNAP uh, educator that generally tries to find the locations for the food banks and the food drives. So it's kind of a, 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 a unit-wide type of uh, program. So when we know that we want to bring in a mobile market or bring in food for the community, it's the uh, educators within our unit that get together and, and talk about where it's going to be and, and how it's going to be handled. And I'll just uh, dovetail off of your uh, uh, message there, Lori. And that's just to say that as far as the mobile markets go, um, we really have to work with the food banks to see what their priority areas are and where they have seen uh, the need for these mobile pantries. And so really it's just a matter of starting a conversation with the larger food bank to ask them if this is, um, 
a, uh, a project that they are willing to get involved with and where those locations are where they are trying to reach. Okay, so the next question is, how helpful are local governments in getting these community gardens started? For example, helping to provide garden space or location of unused spaces or unused spaces or empty lots in the community. Um, we're, we're handing around a headset here, so I apologize if there's a little bit of a break, but someone asked about how helpful local governments are. Um, it depends. Um, and, and sometimes you, you find that the community food projects are started sort of organically in your community. Um, on a real positive note, we look at uh, Mount Vernon Community Gardens was actually started, uh, initiated by the county chair person, Bob White and Dante Moore, one of the city council members. Uh, they were very interested in starting a community garden and contacted myself. I'm a community and economic development educator and Lori George, Small Farms Local Foods. And the two of us actually led uh, community planning sessions for several months before the garden was established. Um, we even identified a volunteer operations manager for the garden. Um, in other cases, and, it, and it's, it's not really the, I wouldn't say the, the local government's uh, uh, disinterest, it's, it's more sometimes their opportunities for actually having the funding. Um, <clears throat> but for instance, uh, Ashley, which she might want to talk a little bit about her work, she's not working with a local government, but she's actually working with the local hospital to get the funding to do a mobile market. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question. We're starting to get a lot of questions here, which is great. Uh, can, you, can the UI Extension staff help us with strategies for getting the word out about our new mobile food pantry program? And I, I probably could answer that actually, but I'll. I'll put you want to repeat the, the question for me, Nancy? Go sure. ahead. Sure. Sure. Repeat the question. Uh, the question was whether or not UI Extension staff could help with strategies for getting the word out about our new mobile food pa pantry program. So someone's asking about their own mobile food pantry program and possibly. I can, I can speak spreading. to the, the uh, mobile market program uh, that we have. Uh, we have. Um, our marketing and communications coordinator created a, a couple of flyers advertising uh, the mobile markets and their location and, and monthly distribution times. And then we've uh, been able to get that information distributed to the public um, by going to uh, WIC offices, going to um, what we have here, we have a BCMW, um, taking it to uh, other uh, you know, brick and mortar food pantries to let them know. So uh, we just created flyers um, and distributed them in the community. Um, we also did an announcement on our local radio. Uh, and then we also, um, Ashley, you can help me if you can think of any other uh, besides the flyer. Oh, Facebook, I think, was another way that yeah. we it out uh, at least through our 4-H Facebook pages and then on our uh, unit Facebook page information about the location and times of those monthly pantries. And, and to, more to the question too is does extension ha uh, staff help with that? Uh, many of our extension educators are able to help with uh, opportunities on how to market different projects whether you're talking about a farmer's market, a mobile market, or a um, community garden. I, I do recommend the social media. I, it's certainly whatever project you're doing, it's worthwhile to have someone set up a Facebook page. Just make sure you have multiple administrators. One of the issues that I've run into is that you only have one administrator on the Facebook page, that person leaves and then nobody can get in and operate the Facebook page. So you wanna make sure you have a lot of people in there. Uh, Twitter is also available, Instagram. Um, there's several, several mode, uh, social media sites. But yes, if you're having problems marketing or setting up or planning, 
uh, contact your local extension office and talk to them. Generally, I would start asking to talk to one of their, what they call an ag and natural resource educator, uh, someone that works with the, the community food project. But as I mentioned, we have staff all over the state in every county. So uh, just make sure you go to the website and find someone. So I'm just looking ahead at the questions and I see the next one says, uh, so is a food desert essentially the absence of a full line grocery store? And you know, I would say that um, to answer that, it is defined um, as an area where the residents have limited or no access uh, to, to the type of grocery store like you are describing that has the fresh fruits and vegetables, so a full line grocery store. But it is further defined uh, as 10 miles in the rural parts and one mile uh, in the urban locations. Thank you, Liz. Any other questions, Nancy? Yes, so I'm gonna ask, I'm, I'm gonna skip around a little bit here. Um, we had a question from one of our other educators about the definition of a food desert and um, did you, you know, want I'm gonna, to specify on the whether or not it's the absence of a full-line grocery store, but what are the other, if you want to just go over that really quick, what are the you know, other? Let me just move this on to Ashley. Ashley's the expert on food deserts. So could you ask, ask the question mm -hmm. her again? I'm going to give her the headset once she's on. Go ahead and ask her. Okay. <laughs> What is the so question? Is, the, is a food desert essentially the absence of a full-line grocery store? So the USDA, um, they actually define um, what's considered a food desert as um, at least 500 people or at least 33% of that census tract population must reside more than one mile from a supermarket or a large grocery store. Um, and for more rural census tracts, that distance is more than 10 miles. So it's not necessarily, um, you know, right there, but it, it, they look at mileage um, to where the nearest supermarket or gro grocery store is. Okay. Um, and then the next question, I'll put it to uh, Dr. Lori George first, and um, then she can pass it around. This is sort of okay. our pecking order of, of uh, <laughs> uh, presenter responses. Okay, one moment. Okay, this is Lori. I'm going to combine two questions here because they're very similar. Um, what kinds of organizations tend to be your most common partners in these initiatives across the state? And then there was another question about if faith-based organizations um, can assist with these community projects, and maybe if you want to speak to the viability of those types of partners. Believe it or not, the largest group that we get uh, notifications from that they want to start community gardens are the faith-based groups. They're the churches. They're the the synagogues, the people that want to try and make a difference in their surrounding neighborhood because they're out there, they see what's happening out there, um, they want to make a difference. Um, so the, the largest one we have are the faith-based and the next one down are going to be specific individuals that are in a community or they live in a low-income area and they see what their neighbors are going through and they want to be able to try and make a difference. So they generally call us and say, I have a piece of land, I want to be able to do something with it, but I don't know how to get started. Uh, so individuals are our second largest uh, organization or groups that, that come and talk to us about starting a garden. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question is really interesting from Renee Katich. I hope I uh, pronounced your last name correctly. Um, our community has a food bank and a nutrition center that provides daily meals. We are currently exploring a community garden as well. How can we do this without taking business, business from one local grocery store that we have? That's the tough part is trying to start a community garden when you already have existing food stores or grocery stores, but it's not something that's going to take away from the grocery store. 
Uh, the community garden itself is going to be established. Uh, you establish one for several reasons. Number one, you want to be able to feed the people in the neighborhood. But number two, you want to teach them how to grow their own food so they can become self-sufficient with that as well. And so what you need to do is when you're starting a community garden, you know that there will be grocery stores around there, but you're not taking anything away from them. And it's always nice to be able to reach out to the community if it's an individual or, or somebody that wants to start a garden, to be able to reach out and to the community and businesses and say, this is what we want to start doing. Um, and the community garden is going to be for the people in the area or the neighborhood that wants to grow their own food or for food that we're going to donate specifically to food banks and soup kitchens in the area. So it's not really competing with the grocery stores. I think it's working in conjunction with them to, to target those low income or food deserts where people live. Okay, I think that this next question pertains to you, Lori, and if not, maybe you can pass it to another person. Um, are there any efforts being made to build grocery stores in food deserts or any access to capital funding for such a project? If so, can you share with us any resources? Uh, getting food uh, buildings or food entities into food deserts can be a costly endeavor, depending on the organization or who wants to do it, especially if you do a building a brick and mortar. Um, usually within food deserts, uh, the mobile markets work re really well on that. Um, it's not something they have to pay tax on as far as property tax or building uh, city taxes, anything. It's a mobile market is getting a truck or a, an old school bus and converting it and then taking the food to where those people need to go. As far as funding for commercial ventures to build into um, food deserts, I'll hand that over to Pam. Um, if you're talking about actually building a grocery store or a food hub or something like that, um, there are communities that are doing things in a variety of different ways. Um, you could do it in a conventional sense, uh, just, you know, starting a business, uh, you know, initiating a limited liability company, an LLC or a corporation. But what I'd recommend if you're actually in an area like that is to look at the opportunity of starting something like a community development corporation. Uh, that's a group of people that get together, maybe raise funds and uh, go into it together. Um, there's also a project going on right now at Western Illinois University. Um, they are talking about ways to start small grocery stores. Um, I don't think I have that information with me, but if whoever is asking the question, if you could just put your email address in the text box or the chat box, Nancy will send that to me and I will send you the information on what uh, Western Illinois University is doing right now. Okay, that sounds great. So there's one last question. Um, feel free if we have a few um, minutes left, about 10 minutes left of the noon hour. If you have any other questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. But our last question currently is, are Dollar Generals counted as grocery stores? Um, in some places, Dollar General is the only grocery store they have. Um, and I am, you will not hear me put down a Dollar General because if it wasn't for Dollar Generals, many of these communities uh, would not have anything at all uh, as far as food. I mean, uh, does it constitute a grocery store in the sense of a food desert? It may not. Um, it's not a full-fledged grocery store, but Dollar Generals and Casey's um, both. Uh, unfortunately, um, in rural communities today, it may be the only options people have. Uh, the only thing is, is uh, Lori's putting up a little sign for me, they have generally don't have any fresh veggies or fresh vegetables. But that's where your community can, if you've got a Dollar General and you're not able to provide that, you can look into the mobile markets or you could look into developing a community garden. Uh, for instance, in Mount Vernon, I don't think anybody 
talked about that, but in Mount Vernon, we have 39 beds, and of those, 13 are donation beds. So families take a bed for themselves. Uh, they take most of their own produce that they grow home. Uh, anything left is given to the food banks, and the 13 beds that are um, taken care of by guard or volunteer gardeners, all of the food from those beds go to the local food bank. And Anne just put up a link um, for the the WIU resource there, the Illinois Institute for Rural Affairs and Cooperatives. Um, I will also include that resource link in the follow up email to the participants for today, along with the that. recording. Yeah, it's a new idea for ways to bring um, uh, food and and. For those communities who are not large enough or they're losing their grocery stores, it's a new idea uh, that uh, the Illinois Institute for Rural Affairs at Western has come up with, and it sounds uh, pretty uh, neat. So I encourage everyone to take a look at that. And thank you very much for finding that link for us. Sure, and um, if there are no further questions today, I just want to thank everybody for participating in the webinar. As a reminder, a video recording of today's webinar will be available on the local government education archives. Uh, I will include a link to that in the follow-up email, and it'll also be available um, in the archives at a later date. We hope you'll all also be able to join us for next month's webinar, which is developing a creative economy, which will be, um, uh, Pam Shalhorn will be presenting uh, to us that program um, as well. And Pam, since we are lucky enough, we have you on the call. If you want to say one or two um, sentences about what to expect, that's fine. Otherwise, I'll, I'll also be able to provide a little bit of a description in the follow-up email about the next webinar. Well, we were talking today about how rural communities can help bring food uh, to the people that live in them, uh, especially when they don't have the grocery stores or they're relying on um, uh, dollar generals. What I'm going to be talking about uh, next month, developing a creative economy, is where you can use a variety of ways to tap into talent that is not only available in urban areas, but also rural areas to develop small businesses in, uh, in very small ways. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about pop-up shops and some other ways uh, to develop markets. Uh, this is something that can help build a community's retail base um, when they've lost a lot of shops or stores in their downtown area or you know, in general. So I look forward to giving the presentation next month. Thank you, Nancy, for um, having all of us, by the way, on your local government education program. And I want to remind everyone again that uh, if you want to start a community food project, um, there's a lot of great advice waiting for you at your local extension office. So make sure you give them a call uh, before you get started. All right, thanks again to everybody for participating today. Have a great day.